It is Mecca. It's Wakanda. It is a, a refuge. If you live in the South and you happen to be black and be gay, this is as free a city as you're going to find. I think it's the greatest place on earth. When I moved here, I was like, oh, thank God, yeah. I would have a new clean slate. I can reinvent myself. I'm able to be comfortable in my own skin. You have all these black gay men rushing to Atlanta. And Atlanta is not the land of milk and honey they thought it was going to be. Who thinks that they're going to be diagnosed with an illness that could possibly kill you, that you may not see 30 or you may not see 40? White America believes this is over. I mean, you actually hear people say the height of the epidemic. There is no way that 1989 was the fucking height. We're not just going to sit back and watch our brothers die. We're going to do something about it. If you're a gay black man in America today, your risk of contracting HIV is one in two. I've come to Atlanta, Georgia. Long seen as a mecca for gay black men, thousands move here each year from across the country to start a new life. All right, so y'all, I'm going to do a little dance for y'all. It's a little Jay set. This is 25-year-old Darian, who moved to Atlanta from Huntsville, Alabama in 2014. So it's all like this. So we'll do it one more time. I came out in seventh grade in middle school. I had this crush on this guy, and someone told him uh, I had a crush on him. So he went back and told his mom, who told the principal, who told my parents. And then he called me to the principal's office and was like, we don't accept that going on in our school. And my stepdad, he was like, he's from that, that hood, urban side of town. He was like, if I hear one more thing about you being gay, I'll ship you back to your dad. How old were you when that happened? I want to say 13, 14. Hola! Hey. How are you? At the age of 21, Darian left the conservative city for Atlanta, where he could live freely as a gay man. Are you different now, do you think, than the Darian that lived in Alabama? Yes. I was very shy. Growing up, I was antisocial. I was very skinny, I like a tweet. When I moved here, I started working out more just to build my muscle up. Um, started getting tattoos mm -hmm. everywhere. I feel like I like when I say I was gonna revamp myself, I really revamp myself. Mm -hmm. So I, I like the new me. After three years in the city, he contracted HIV. I was feeling very sick. So I remember leaving work, went to the doctor's office, and they said, okay, you have gonorrhea and acute HIV. I was so shocked. I just started thinking, why me? I was just break down crying. It's like, Darion, how did you get yourself to this point where you contracted HIV? So had you been using condoms consistently before this happened? Uh, a few times, like I want to say two or three times, I would slip up and not use them. But I would get tested on a regular basis. I would go and get tested from three to six months. And every time I got tested, it was negative. So I wasn't really worried about it. Like many young people, Darian was careless with condoms two or three times. But unlike most young people, his risk of HIV was so high because of who he is and where he is. I've come to meet Tori Cooper, an HIV prevention specialist on the front line of the epidemic in Atlanta. Some people like black condoms, some people like non-latex condoms, some people like insertive condoms, some people like the larger condoms. A personal favorite, have you ever seen this before? I have not. So it's an FC2 and this is a condom. I want you to open, we're gonna okay. open one together. This is great because it goes inside mm -hmm. of the receptive partner. And I always tell people, if your partner is bigger around than that, then you probably should not date him, <laughs> all right? So, <laughs> How much more at risk of contracting HIV are you as a black gay man than a white gay man? So a black gay man in the South, his chances of getting HIV are about one out of two. For white gay men, it's closer to around one out of 11. So that's really a startling statistic. Sometimes because of their skin color, they have access to certain things that, that black gay men don't generally. I'm generalizing here. And sometimes that includes access to stuff like PrEP, 
which it stands for pre-exposure prophylaxis, and that's for people who are HIV negative. It's a pill that they take once a day that keeps them HIV negative. It keeps them from getting HIV. And what we're finding is, um, as PrEP continues to roll out, there are a lot more people who are white, who may not be as high risk, who have access to PrEP. If you're someone for whom 85% of the billboards are targeting you, they have pictures of you on there, then you start to realize, hey, this is a message for me. We have had 35 years of messaging for white gay men. They've gotten it, or at least they're getting it, and they're far ahead than, than everybody else. Lower rates of health access, education, and income have all been found to play a role in the HIV rate among gay African-American men. But these systematic and historical factors are not enough to persuade everyone. Some people place the blame for the HIV epidemic solely on the gay black men living through it. We live in an era where the morals have vanished out here. And everybody's fucking and sucking everything they can get their hands on. This is Walter Lee Hampton II, a controversial YouTuber on Atlanta's gay scene. As someone who is HIV negative, he's often accused of demonizing gay black men and ignoring the evidence of what's really behind America's HIV problem. How do you explain the fact that it's still such a problem in the black community and not in the white community? Because for a lot of people that shows that it isn't just about behavior, it's about things like healthcare and education. I'm a member of the black gay community. I understand and I see what's going on, and it's unfortunate what I see going on in our community. They, these guys are not trying to build relationships. White guys are more prone to get into relationships. I mean, I don't know if that's true. Well, I know it's true. If there have been studies done that show that black gay men actually have fewer sexual partners than <laughs> white gay men. Well, nobody's going to walk into a study, uh, into a, talk to a... <sighs> A person who's taking a study and say, well, you know, I just slept with five people in the past 48 hours. People are not going to tell the truth. I know what these guys are doing. Nobody's this is like an America-wide study that, that oh. shows that black men engage in less yeah. risky sexual behavior, I have fewer partners. I take that study and toss it into the trash can. And I'm being very serious with you because I know that's not accurate. I talk to too many people nationwide who tell me partner after partner has insisted that they do not have protected sex. They want But maybe that's the same sex. in the white community. Well, it could be the same in the white yeah. community. I can't tell you nothing about what's going on in white America. So in white America, I don't know men have more sexual partners than black men. I don't They're know anything about just that. just as likely to I use just, a condom. I couldn't tell you anything about their, their sexual practice because I'm not a white man. Mm. My point is, if, if the sexual behavior doesn't differ, why is the problem so big in the black community? Is it not something systematic that's happening as well as this when, promiscuity that you see? When you say systematic, you think somebody's out there injecting these guys with HIV? No. Okay, so when you say systematic, what do you mean? Explain it to me. I mean education, access to healthcare, historical interventions being targeted at the white community. <laughs> there are a lot of factors that a lot of other people see. Yeah. Well, because I'm black and gay, and I've sat here in Atlanta since 1989, and I've witnessed and watched friends all over the United States within the black gay community. I can honestly say promiscuous, risky sexual behavior is the problem. That is the problem. All right, so this is my HIV minutes. So I'll take one a day. What would happen if you didn't stick to this? If you don't stick in medicine, you will develop uh, AIDS, and they will really kill you. So, if you take in medicine, eat right, live right, you you uh, you keep your T cells higher and your viral loads down, and with that, um, you you'll be, um, be able to maintain a HIV positive undetectable status. And what does it mean to have an undetectable viral load? You're not able to transmit the virus to somebody else. So if you're undetectable as you are now, if you sleep with somebody even unprotected, would they would it. not get HIV. Mm -mm. So it's basically impossible for you to transmit HIV to anybody no, else right not, now. Most of my medicine, there's, there's no way they can get it. Mm -hmm. There's no way. How much does it cost? Ooh, it costs a lot. Oh, um, but there's different programs out there. Like this costs two thousand dollars, and uh, per bottle, yeah, two thousand dollars.
In the months following his diagnosis, Darian has joined a group called Thrive. They hold regular meetups where gay black men socialise and talk about their experiences living with HIV. Darian is one of their youngest and newest members. Some of us were just diagnosed uh, last summer. And some of us have been living with HIV three plus decades. So if anybody can speak to like... The stigma then was so thick because mm. families were rejecting them. Preachers were preaching that this was God's plague. I had friends dying and the church would not do their services. We would have memorial services in bars in our backyards because they wouldn't do it. And then with the medicine uh, making people so sick, a lot of people wouldn't take the medicine. I wouldn't take it. I took AZT for two days. I said, no, if I'm going out, bring me a bottle of scotch. I'm going to go out and get the well, well, for me, being newly diagnosed, I was like kind of scared at first. My mom, she's a registered nurse, so she sees this all the time, and she would keep preach it to me, make sure you wrap it up. So she was the first one I told, and I was kind of, I feel like I slapped her in the face. I get angry because I feel like my generation didn't do enough to protect you. That, that's just me. The first thing that goes through my mind is, you should not be positive, and young men should not be leaving this planet with AIDS, with this disease. White people, or white men specifically, aren't getting it as much, so the response is totally watered down. And when we think about all of the other things that affect black men, that, you know, when we do the what if around them, so like, what if said thing, what if police brutality were happening against mostly white men? What would the response be then? The onus is always on us. You should have done more to avoid you getting it. We don't challenge or question the systems that are set up that leave us predisposed to getting HIV. I believe she was being filmed for a movie. I have to live my truth. Support systems like Thrive are often life-saving for people living with HIV. But for the most marginalised communities, a lack of support can have dangerous consequences. For black trans women, the HIV rate is also one in two. But their risk of homelessness, drug addiction and prostitution is higher. And each of these make it harder to access the HIV care they need. I met Pearl in Piedmont Park as she did her weekly outreach for the homeless women who live there. We have jeans, short pants, sweaters, dresses, skirts. These are gift bags, which consist of condoms, lube, makeup, literature, and eyebrow pencils and all the little accessories every girl needs. Yeah. <laughs> Because there's not too many organizations out there now that are helping transgenders that are homeless and living with HIV. Mm -hmm. So I took it upon myself to do something like that because I'm also I was also homeless yeah. and I'm living with HIV. So it's, I was down there with them at one point. Were you in this park? Yes. I was on drugs. I was out there prostituting, doing whatever it took to survive. What do you think it is about being trans as well as black that makes people more likely to end up as homeless. You, you dealing with HIV, being trans, being black. <laughs> you got all them strikes against you. A lot of these trans was damaged from their homes. Parents putting them out at young ages. And I know it's gotta be a deep down hurt. So it, I don't think it's never over. And I think that will hold them still into that bad spot where they at. I dribble my ass like a basketball. I dribble my ass like a basketball. John Maloney told you I was coming last season. Lemon pepper wings fries, extra season. Go on, dance, girl, get it. It's your season. John Maloney season. John Maloney season. Sleeping so good on this temple Kiss so good, had to let him eat it. Bitch so bad, had to let him eat it. I'm the girl in the picture. I'm the one when I'm with you. Let's get it. This is my picture. Oh. Next year, Darian will come off his mum's insurance policy, leaving him unable to pay the $2,000 a month he needs for his medicine. Through his support network, he has found out about programs that can help towards the cost. But for other young gay black men across America, these resources simply aren't there. Right now, I feel like with that younger generation, they feel so isolated from people 
who has information about medicine or, or who can't afford medicine, so they don't take it. And that's why it's more the younger generation dying now quicker than the ones who lived through it back in the day. So if everybody had their viral load low, low nobody would be catching HIV. Mm -hmm. I think for a long time people have simply not cared. When we talk about even the first initial cases, we forget that there were black people suffering and dying at the very beginning as well. And so we became an afterthought even from the beginning. But I remember a time the communities rallying around young men who were dying and, and holding them up to look into faces like Darion and to think, you may not be in this situation if people saw value in your life. 